By the end of the 16th century, the Spanish and Portuguese had discovered almost half of the world, but their sea routes were strictly secret. And so, the Dutch had to find their way across the oceans by themselves. Bijbrand van Waerwijk was a vice admiral of the second Dutch fleet heading for the rich Indies on behalf of the company van Ferre. No sooner had they set sail than the fleet was scattered by a gale. And so van Waerwijk had to try and round the treacherous Cape of Good Hope on his own. Having managed that, he tried to follow the routes of earlier Dutch ships but the winds forced him further eastward than he had intended, and so instead of landing at Madagascar, he discovered an island as yet unknown to the Dutch. He named it Mauritius, after his prince. There he found a beautiful and sheltered bay where he anchored his ships and went ashore. The year was 1598. Later they discovered that the island had already been visited by the Portuguese who had lost interest after a few short calls. And so, 350 years later, it was von Warwijk who was honored with a monument here as the first skipper to land in Mauritius and give it its name. The road to the spot where the Dutch first landed is marked by a sign showing the coats of arms of three important Dutch provinces. The same coats of arms on the same kind of sign can be seen on an old print. From this print, it appears that the Dutch had stumbled upon a true paradise in Mauritius. There was plenty of water and food, ships could be repaired, and the men could hunt and fish to their heart's content. They had a good time with the gigantic tortoises, which according to the journals, could carry two men at once on their backs. Another creature the Dutch found in this paradise was the dodo, which had grown so fat and lazy that it was no longer able to fly. They called it the loathsome bird because its meat was inedible. Unfortunately, this unique bird was to become totally extinct during the Dutch period. Many years later, ornithologists tried to reconstruct the dodo. This was possible with the help of old prints and the innumerable bones which were found, enough to build a complete skeleton. In the following years, Mauritius became a regular anchorage for one Dutch ship after another thus naturally developing into a Dutch colony. The first governor built a timber fortress on the bay. This was later replaced by a large stone fort, which was given the name Frederik Hendrik after Prince Marit's brother. For a hundred years, Mauritius proved an ideal victualling stop for the Dutch, where sailors could recuperate from the rough voyage and where there was a non-stop repair depot for damaged ships. This past may have inspired the development of a small industry, manufacturing detailed models of 17th and 18th century ships for customers all over the world. Day in, day out, men and women work on little decks, cannons, masts and riggings with painful meticulousness. Each replica exudes the atmosphere of adventure, sea battles, shipwreck, exploration and discovery. For every ship from those days represented a world in itself with its own history.
The Daufia was one such ship, not much bigger than a yacht. In 1605, it was sent out to sea from Java in search of the mysterious south. First, half the crew was killed by Papuans off the coast of New Guinea, and then there was another victim a week later when they landed in an unknown place. Unknowingly, they had discovered Australia. According to the Greek philosophy of equilibrium, if there was land in the north, there should be just as much land in the south. In 150 AD, Greek astronomer Ptolemaeus drew a map showing this mysterious land of the south as a big white blob attached to the bottom of Africa. Later, cartographers simply copied this Greek concept. Around 1600, the Dutch maps indicated the unknown continent as Terra Australis Incognita, the unknown land of the south. Jan Huygen van Linschoten had managed to steal a lot of information from the Portuguese, and through him, the Dutch finally realized that the Southland couldn't possibly be attached to Africa. You could sail round the bottom of Africa to get to the Indies. Unfortunately, that particular route could mean terrible delays because of the frequent calms. And so, the Dutch embarked on a serious investigation of winds and currents, hoping to come up with faster routes. A certain Captain Brouwer had his own theory on winds and currents, and in 1610, he was commissioned to try out a new route. After rounding Cape of Good Hope, he didn't take the usual shortcut via Madagascar, but instead sailed much further south. There he found very favorable winds which carried him a thousand miles to the east in one hop. Since in those days speed could only be gauged by means of an hourglass and a small board tied to a rope with knots in it, the probability of error was enormous. The crucial point about this new route was to turn to the north at exactly the right moment. If you miss that turn, you could get hopelessly lost. This is what happened to skipper Dirk Hartogs, whose ship, the Unity, had strayed from the fleet. Where he'd expected open sea, he suddenly saw an unknown country looming before the bowsprit. He anchored off one of the islands. As proof of the fact that he had been there, he planted a pole on the tip of the island and nailed a tin plate onto it. On this plate, he wrote that his ship, the Unity, had arrived here on October the 25th, 1616. He didn't find much of interest, and the mainland behind it looked just as bleak and boring. Still, Skipper Hartogs mapped out as much as he could, naming the island after his ship, Land of Unity. More and more Dutch ships purposely or accidentally arrived on this new coast, and numerous Dutch names appeared on each new map. It also became the scene of many fateful shipwrecks. One of the most dramatic disasters befell the company's latest showpiece, the Batavia. This ship seemed to be doomed from the start. The presence on board of an unusually high number of women had already given rise to complications, and things were further aggravated by the continual rows between Captain Jakobson, the merchant Cornelison, and Commander Pelsat, the latter having great difficulty upholding his authority since he was lying desperately ill in his bunk. The captain had already been toying with the idea of turning the Batavia into a pirate ship and was only stopped by Cornelison, a fearful bully who himself was waiting for the right moment to grab power. Mm -hmm. 
This moment arrived in the night of June the 4th, 1628, when the ship crashed onto coral reefs with such force that the ailing Pelsart was hurled out of his bunk. In lifeboats, most of the men reached the small islands which were near. Commander Pelsart took skipper Jakobson and 50 other men with him in the largest lifeboat to find fresh water. When they were unsuccessful, they decided to sail on to Batavia to get help. It was then that merchant Cornelison struck. With the help of his henchmen, he took care of all his adversaries. 150 men, women and children were drowned, strangled and stabbed, or had their throats cut. A number of men had refused to join Cornelison. Just before the massacre, they were sent to another island on the pretense that they should look for water. In fact, Cornelison hoped they would starve or perish from thirst. As soon as these men were safely out of the way, Cornelison appointed himself governor, dressing himself in the most exquisite fabrics from the wreck of the Batavia. He and his council began a reign of terror, taking the surviving women, including the pretty Lucretia Jansdochter, as mistresses, with the necessary violence, of course. On the ship, Lucretia had already been assaulted once by skipper Jakobson. Now, Cornelison forced her to be his concubine, while the so-called council took their pick from the other young ladies who had been dreaming of a romantic future in Batavia. Contrary to Cornelison's expectations, the men who were marooned on this island did not perish. They almost immediately found water and then ventured deeper into the island, searching for other means to survive. The, the, um, yeah, the wells are where the big bushes are, and we just keep going on over the hill then the bushes will stop, and then the open ground, and the forts are out there. Yeah. And what's the distance about? Oh, well, the distance is about 20 minutes. OK. Let's go. It was a difficult walk, crunching across coral, following the trail of the crew of the Batavia. Besides water, they had found food here as well, seals and birds, and especially wallabies, which the castaways mistook for a large sort of cat. The island was positively teeming with these creatures. Weber Hayes, a private from a small Dutch town, immediately stood out as natural-born leader of the group, which mainly consisted of soldiers. Someone who had managed to escape from the massacre told them of Cornelison's reign of terror on the other island. They realized at once that their lives were at stake and organized themselves as well as they could with the available means. They thoroughly explored the entire island for the best site to make a defense. They eventually selected an open piece of ground in the middle of the island. It's not so big. Nope, not Castle Wallaby. And they had a good view from here? Yes, this is one of the few parts of the island where they would have had an open view. Not a very big one, but certainly an open view all the way round. So um, it would give them a bit of time if they were being attacked by the mutineers. To protect themselves against the rebels on the other island, Weber Hayes and his men built this fortification. It's the smallest Dutch fort ever built anywhere in the world and also the earliest European construction in Australia. 
one can hardly imagine the things that went on here more than 350 years ago. That the Europeans were made. It is unforeseeable what sich here more than 350 years ago has played. The minuscule fortress was attacked twice by the rebels. However, Viber Hayes made a plucky stand and during the second attack even managed to take Cornelis own prisoner. When three months later Pelset returned with reinforcements, he was warned in time by Viber Hayes and so was able to capture the rebels without much trouble. Cornelisone himself and the worst hooligans had their hands cut off on the spot and then were hung without mercy. Of the 250 crew members of the wretched ship, only 74 reached Batavia. The rest had been drowned, massacred or executed. In recent times, intensive research has been carried out as to just where the Batavia went down. For a long time, it was thought that the disaster had taken place on islands much further to the south. In 1955, an Australian woman came across a comment in Pelsert's journals on the peculiar kind of cats with which Viber Hayes and his men had fed themselves. These so-called cats could only have been wallabies, she thought which live on the islands named after them. In 1960, an English frogman started diving on the spot which the woman had indicated as the most likely one. His efforts produced no substantial results, but several years later, the wreck of the Batavia was found not far away from there. It's a very dangerous area for diving, as the reefs pile up heavy breakers, causing such turmoil in the water that diving gear is instantly ripped off. Most of what was left of the Batavia after three centuries has now been brought to the surface. But on a clear day, when the sea is calm, you can still dive about six meters underwater and come across all kinds of objects amongst the fish and seaweed, even totally overgrown ship's cannons. In the Museum of Perth in Western Australia, one not only finds the canons of the Batavia, but also the complete history of the disaster in texts and prints, as well as everything else which has been brought up from the bottom of the sea, like remnants of the cargo and an interesting collection of ancient utensils. They have also started to dig on the island where Cornelison wreaked such carnage. Underneath the cabin of a crab fisherman, they found a skeleton, undoubtedly one of the crew of the Batavia. The skeleton's bones were pretty well intact, but the dislocated jaw and the wound in the skull are clear signs of the violence which went on there. Divers of the Australian Navy, in cooperation with the Museum of Western Australia, have searched extensively for the remnants of the wreck of the Batavia. Scattered everywhere, they found the tiny bricks which used to be taken along as ballast. Everything was photographed, classified and numbered before being brought to the surface. They found complete sections of the stern, the keel and the hull, which had to be carefully taken apart. A 
As soon as they emerged from the sea, all these loose bits and parts had to be treated with special chemicals to prevent them from disintegrating. After that, whole parts of the ship could be reconstructed like a jigsaw puzzle. In the wreck of the Batavia, they also found enormous stones. At first, the archaeologists were at a loss as to why these stones had been carried along. Maybe they served as ballast, like the many thousands of tiny bricks that had been found in the water. But similar large stones were found which had been carved. So they must have been for a completely different purpose. In the museum, these stones now form an enormous gate, which, further research has shown, was intended for the castle in Batavia. In this museum were these stones, stuk for stuk, opgestapeld tot an enorme grote poort. And weer further onderzoek bracht aan het licht dat deze poort bestemd was voor het kasteel in Batavia. Since the appropriate stones never reached their destination, Jan Peter's own Kuhn, the governor general of Batavia, had to have local stones quarried in order to build the castle's new gateway. After Pelsert's disaster, the enthusiasm for the Southland in Batavia had thoroughly cooled down. Apart from a feeble attempt in 1634, it wasn't until 1642 that the new Governor-General, Antony van Diemen, fitted out a new expedition. Leading this expedition was Abel Tasman, who came from a tiny hamlet in the north of Holland. On August the 14th, he sailed from Batavia, following the old route to Mauritius. With his two ships, the Heemskerk and the Zeehan, he entered the bay and anchored opposite Fort Frederick Hendrik. In this bay, he stayed for an entire month, taking on fresh water and food supplies and also repairing the rather ramshackle ships. In October, the expedition set off on an easterly course which ran so far south that the explorers would have missed Australia completely had a storm not forced them northwards again. But Tasman did encounter some land. This he named after his governor, Antony van Diemen Land. For many days, he sailed along the coastline without realizing that he'd found an island. Along the way, he named two mountains after his ships, Heemskerk and Zeehan. Occasionally, Tasman spied smoke curling up, but otherwise saw no sign of life. Eventually, he sailed into a large cove, giving it the name Frederick Hendrik Bay. Not everyone has a talent for discovering new land, Governor Van Diemen wrote afterwards to the 17 gentlemen. What he meant to say was that Abel Tasman was perhaps not the most adventurous Dutchman ever to have sailed. During the entire expedition, in fact, he had been scared stiff of being eaten by the natives. It was indeed with great reluctance that Abel Tasman finally anchored in this bay. The mere thought of actually going ashore was more than he could bear, even if there wasn't a single native in sight. Still, he wanted to leave some proof of his presence, and so finally he had a carpenter swim ashore in order to set up a pole and nail a flag to it. The memorial stone, which later was placed here in his honor, actually grants Tasman a lot more credit than he deserves. So oh, this is the memorial, Mike. Yes, that's right. It says at this spot, 
the expedition under Abel Jansen Tasman being the first white people to set foot on Tasmanian soil. It was on this spot that Abel Tasman's expedition landed. They were the first white men to set foot on Tasmanian ground, planting the Dutch flag here on December the 3rd, 1642. The Hollandse flag on 3 December 1642. As a memorial to posterity, yeah. and to the inhabitants of this country. Since Tasman had not really explored the island at all, the 17 gentlemen could hardly work up much enthusiasm for it, and later on, the English were to take possession. They founded Port Arthur, changing the island's name from Van Diemen Land to Tasmania, a late tribute to its Dutch discoverer. At first, the English used Tasmania as a convict colony. About 10,000 English prisoners served sentences in this building, ranging from several years to a lifetime. Until around 1880, the British convicts were locked up here at night in small cells, while during the day they were put to hard labor. Escape was virtually impossible, as the spit of land on which this building stands was sealed off from the rest of the island by a long row of chained bloodhounds, and no man dared try to pass. Large areas of Australia were used mainly as convict colonies during the first period of British rule. Not until the last century did more and more colonists and immigrants begin to come, mainly farmers and craftsmen, not only from England, but also from France, Germany, and from Holland. This Dutch immigrant has a unique object on his terrace, a tribute to the discoverer and namesake of his second homeland, a wooden bust of Abel Tasman. Contrary to their usual habit, the Dutch did little more in the Antipodes than discover and map them, and, apart from wrecked ships, left behind few tangible traces. Only monuments remind us of their initial presence. Since the wind was coming from the wrong direction for further exploration, Tasman's two ships soon left Tasmania, sailing eastwards for eight days across what is now called the Tasman Sea. And again they struck land, as Tasman wrote in his journal on December the 18th, 1642. Immediately, he started to map the coastline of the beautiful bay which they had found. Later, though not without his usual procrastination, Tasman decided to send a lifeboat ashore to investigate. By now, he and his men were in desperate need of fresh water and food. But no sooner had the boat embarked than 11 canoes full of natives suddenly appeared and immediately attacked. Before they could be driven off with musket and cannon fire, four sailors were killed. This initial encounter with the new country was so unfortunate that Tasman was to mark the spot on his map, Murderer's Bay. Here, in what is now known as Golden Bay, a huge monument was later erected in honor of Tasman's discovery. Tasman called his discovery Startenland, believing it to be connected to another piece of land of the same name near Cape Horn. The East Indian Company subsequently changed the name to New Zealand.
Of course, New Zealand had been discovered much earlier by the Maoris. After long wanderings across the Pacific, they had ended up here calling it the land of the long white cloud and had set themselves up behind solid palisades in areas along the coast. When, 130 years after Tasman, the first English landed here, they were told the legend about the coming long ago of two ships, which the Maoris had totally destroyed with all their white crew. In his journals, Tasman described the Maori as of normal height, well-built, between brown and yellow, with black hair and painted faces. Certainly, Tasman never enjoyed the honor of being clad in the ceremonial cloak which is put round a stranger's shoulders before he is solemnly welcomed into the Maori's close-knit community. Before such a newcomer can partake in tribal activities, he's welcomed in speech and song by the chieftain. Behind the chieftain are the tribesmen and the strangers who have already been adopted by the community. Ritual prescribes a certain space between them and the newcomer, a distance which must then be bridged. On behalf of the Te Awhina community, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our illustrious visitors from afar. So I will sing accordingly this Waiata. <laughs> Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. According to tradition, a stranger coming here for the first time and wishing to be adopted into the tribe must bring a so-called koha, a ritual gift special to this occasion. I'd like to extend their thanks, this wonderful koha, to our marae here. And may I say a wonderful welcome to the members of the Veronica Film Company from overseas. With the hongi, the Maori greeting, they rub noses. It's the final part of the ceremony. And after the hongi, it is time for the hangi. This banquet, which has been baking for an entire day between hot stones buried in the ground, is now ready to be dug up and served, symbolically showing the earth in its role as provider. The Maoris have always been known as a strong, healthy, and martial people. 
tribal wars are now a thing of the past, but their warlike nature still echoes in their songs. While they have no written history, the Maori past is carved into wooden panels, every detail of which conveys its own meaning. The best woodcarver in this tribe is working here on the panels for a new community house in the Marae. On these panels, he depicts not only the character and talents of his ancestors, but also particular events of their lives. One of the new panels deals with a very special person. As he is not a Maori, he won't be given a place inside, but will be put outside against the wall somewhere. The drawing is already finished and the actual carving of the wooden panel can now begin. Here, one can easily recognize the white man who discovered New Zealand, Abel Janssone Tasman. The Maori's community house has not changed its shape or design since Tasman's discovery nor with the arrival of hundreds of thousands of immigrants. Nor has anything changed about their traditional craft, flax weaving, which uses the leaves of a native New Zealand plant. The leaf is first cut into strips, and these are then woven into baskets, bags, hats, and other objects. A Dutch emigrant, Jan van der Klundert, has been living amongst the Maoris during the past 10 years, learning this unique skill. By now, he has mastered the art, and here and there, his own works are beginning to be shown at exhibitions. Following his bloody encounter with the Maoris, Tasman kept sailing back and forth in the bay, searching for a passage between the islands, something he felt sure must exist but could never find. Eventually, the two ships left the newly discovered land and again took to the ocean, setting a northeasterly course and before a month had passed, the expedition came across Tonga and the Fiji Islands. Here they hit the jackpot, for the island's inhabitants turned out to be very friendly and helpful. Dozens of girls came through the surf to meet them, carrying fruit and coconuts. This warm welcome came just in the nick of time, for Tasman and his men were virtually down to the last biscuit and barrel of water. Abel Tasman recorded in great detail every encounter and experience. To Tonga and Fiji, he gave the names Amsterdam and Rotterdam, and he called the entire archipelago the Prince William Islands. Via New Guinea, he finally returned to Batavia after a voyage lasting 10 months. There, he made his last entry into his journal. Your sincere, humble, and ever faithful servant, Abel Janssone Tasman. 
And so more than 50% of all the coastlines of the mysterious south were explored and charted by the Dutch. No wonder then that on all the maps of the world drawn in those days, it is shown as Hollandia Nova or New Holland. This is a very special booklet. It is full of coastal profiles of islands. They were drawn by a male nurse, Victor Victorzone, who, because of his artistic talents, was sent along with the next full-scale Dutch expedition in 1696. Three ships, Yellow Boy, the Weasel and the Pliers, all under the command of William de Vlaming, a former whaler from one of the Dutch islands, headed for the far south. One of their tasks was to search the unknown shores for possible survivors of the many ships lost in those regions. There was, however, no sign of survivors. Indeed, all they found on one of the islands in the Antipodes was a weird kind of animal, which, according to these sailors, most closely resembled a big rat, mainly because of its thick, bare tail. This creature turned out later to be a wallaby again. The entire island was teeming with these animals, and the sailors even took some on board. Because of these alleged rats, de Flaming gave the island the name Rot Nest or Rat Nest. By going ashore here, William de Flaming also earned his first monument, which commemorates the fact that just before New Year's Eve 1696, he landed on Rot Nest's shores. From Rotnest, de Flaming went on to explore the mainland, but the Aborigines remained well hidden. The only living things he discovered were some black swans which he found on a river. A couple were caught and brought on board. The river inevitably came to be called Swan River, and the black swans can still be found there today. The spot where de Flaming went ashore later developed into the city of Perth. Here too, a monument was erected in memory of de Flaming's arrival almost 300 years ago. On the site of this monument, one can also find a kind of compass card, indicating the directions of various places such as Rotnest, Batavia, and even Cape Town. Strangely enough, the direction most important in those days to all Dutch seafarers is missing, the home port of Amsterdam. For home was never far from the hearts and minds of the sailors brought to these foreign shores by wind and water. De Flaming sailed to the north until he reached what he suspected to be Dirk Hartog's island. The artist, Victor Victorson, diligently made drawings of all the coastlines they passed on the way. On the last island they visited, the ship's first mate made an interesting find. He saw a pole stuck into the ground and at its foot, half buried in the sand, a tin plate with an inscription. The site of this discovery was dutifully entered on the map by Victor Victorzone. Tin plate found here. This tin plate can now be seen in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It traveled round the world, witnessed the discovery of Australia, and for almost 80 years remained there, stuck to a pole. This one is a replica. The original lies under a protective layer of plastic on view to the thousands of people who visit the museum each year. The tin plate of Dirk Jan Hartog's is the oldest piece of physical evidence attesting to the early Dutch presence in Australia. Is het allerhoudste bewijsstuk van de aanwezigheid van de Europeanen 
En in dit geval de Nederlanders in Australië. When de Vlaming left, he took Dirk Hartog's plate with him, leaving another in its place. This one was to end up in the Museum of Perth in Australia. This one is de Vlaming's plate. The text he had inscribed was four times as long as the one of Dirk Hartog, with references to virtually every skipper and pilot on all of his three ships. Apart from wrecked ships, those two tin plates are about all the Dutch left behind in the mysterious and unknown Antipodes. Mainly because the so-called 17 gentlemen found nothing to buy or sell out there. Anywhere else in the world, it was far easier to make money. Even though they failed to exploit it, the Southland was, for a century and a half, generally considered the undisputed territory of the Dutch. Dutch ships had sailed its shores. Dutch captains had given names to the landmarks and gradually mapped its coasts. And the legend of Ptolemaeus at last became the reality of New Guinea, of Australia and New Zealand.